Hello, everyone. Um, for those who know, for those who don't know me, I'm Pedro Bachet from Cross Lake Technologies. Um, for those who re don't recognize me, I'm I'm still Pedro. I just changed a bit my look. And um, today I'm updating you on the VNEX, the module of VNEX progress. So the agenda is the usual one. We'll start with a brief introduction about the the what 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 we're doing. Um, then we will um, explain a bit of the progress that we had in the past PI. We will do the live demo as usual, and then we'll conclude with next steps. So just to a quick um, recap about how we got to, to where we are today. Um, three years ago, we did a performance and scalability POC. Uh, at the time we were interested in understanding if a different, a slightly different architecture could yield better results in terms of scalability and cost and efficiency. Um, that POC proved that yes, we could. Um, after that, we went to do an exercise called the reference architecture, which is um, um, an exercise where we design what good looks like and put it in, in a wall so that we have it as, a, as, a, as an inspiration, as a reference for that every time that we change something, we have that very tool telling us if we're getting close to that design or not. What are the objectives um, um, for uh, the reference architecture implementation? So what does it mean? What it means is that our objective is to have cleaner and smaller code bases with less dependencies, easier to contribute and extend, easier to test. You, you can read the rest. This is the dream set and the dream objectives of any, any software tool that, um, that people need to run. So it's basically, we still are guided by these principles. Um, we took an approach called domain-driven design. One of the things that domain-driven design um, um, guides us to, to do is to use an approach into the way where we divide the problem space and then after that, the solution space. So we came up with this at the end of the very, very um, 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 complete exercise of the reference architecture. We came up with these, this design of the bounded content approach, which is basically saying that we have functionality that belongs in different parts of the system. And we made sure that that functionality does not cross the boundaries of that subsystem or that subdomain, as we call it. So all of the yellow boxes that you see, they group a set of um, um, discrete functionality, and you will not see that functionality outside of that box. And this is an important um, implementation detail. Obviously, what you're not seeing is that inside each of these boxes, you have or you have one or more services, one or more libraries. Uh, and this is how we manage and make sure that the code that we have is contained so it's easier to develop as well. So what exactly is module B next? It's the strict implementation of the reference architecture. So that, that's, that's the simplest way of, of, of putting it. It's based on the reference architecture, obviously. Uh, we started with the code name well, actually we had a different code name initially. I, I, I don't recall which one it was. Then we moved to vNext and um, that the current status, uh, the current state of affairs is that is gonna be called uh, Baobab and the release is planned to June next year. It is exactly the same module loop. It's the same feature set, that's the intention. And from the outside, it must look exactly the same. So it, we're just improving the internals. And um, obviously, once this is ready, it will contain an upgrade mechanism so that it's seamless and easier to, to, to upgrade from whatever installation people are running today. Um, and, um, and it's already, there's a lot of pre, um, um, there's already material that is ready already so that people can, um, can start testing and, um, and, and work on upgrade paths. It's not good enough to be used, I, I have to remind you. So in terms of progress, what have we been doing in the past three months? Um, when we first demoed uh, module of vNext, it, it was focusing exclusively on the most important use cases. And it was all only delivering the use cases when they actually function perfectly, which is what we call the golden path. It's when everything aligns and the functionality works as it should. One of the things that we've been doing, and this sounds small, but it's, a, it's actually a lot of work, is making sure that the system still behaves when the inputs and, and, and uh, the, 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 the requests that we receive are not perfectly formed. It's, it's actually much more work than, than having the, the golden path working. We've been doing a, a lot of enhancements around the participation, the participants and the management of participants. 
including things like contact um, account details. Um, we've been doing settlement enhancements, which Jason and, and Michael just showed brilliantly. We implemented transfer timeouts and transfer and bulk transfers. Um, again, a major functionality that was missing. We've also um, completed the user and the role management. We had the foundation last time that we demoed. It was not ready. It was not. Um, it was just the foundation. We now have it completely working. Um, we now have an auditing view as part of the tool with search. We recognize that auditing is for um, regular human beings that they don't want to use technology or, or they don't want to learn special technologies to be able to see the auditing entries so that we have a, a, an auditing page. We started the reporting bounded context and it is a bounded context. I, we, we can talk offline about it, but the way we design it is that we have the ability of doing reporting with um, separate tools without disturbing the performance and, and the capabilities of the transactional engine that is running. Um, we, we now have a bit more advanced application performance monitoring and health checks. We didn't have much of that, now we do. Um, test coverage and documentation. Um, I must admit we're lacking a bit on documentation. We, we are putting an effort to do this. Um, test coverage is increasing rapidly and this is, this is very good news. CI CD pipelines and deployment. We have been enhancing our pipelines. We have fully automatic pipelines for, for lint build testing um, and publishing of libraries and publishing of um, Docker images. What we want to go to next is automatically deploy um, to a live version. So we, we wanna close the loop and have the complete CI CD uh, promise. Automatic execution of full integration tests. This is something that we are picking up. Um, we actually, picked this up a long time ago with, with an idea from Jason and um, we, it's still there to, to be completed. The objective is that we have a, a full environment where we can run the integration test completely. Um, this is gonna be a, a, a very important um, step in guaranteeing the quality. And we're obviously going from the alpha version to a beta version. So a lot of the work is to making sure that we can uh, um, um, deliver a beta quality um, version. This is, this is the usual um, landscape scenario with the happy faces and the not so happy faces that I like to show. Um, you can see that there's a bit more green faces. Um, we're making progress and, and we expect to have pretty much green faces next PI for, for, for almost everything. All right, so now I'm gonna do a live demo. This is the, this is the module loop vnext admin UI. This is what um, Jason also showed before. This is just a UI on top of the API. So I'll start with that. Everything that you will see here is a call to an API that does this functionality. It's authenticated and authorization in place. So there's nothing in here that's magic. There's nothing in here that you could not call with Postman or with another tool. So this is an important because we, we don't want to, to the, the UI doesn't do anything specifically. It's the API that does. So let me log in. Sorry, super secure development passwords that everyone knows. So this is what it looks like. And the first thing that I'm gonna show you is we have a participant, a special participant, that's the hub, obviously. It holds accounts, it holds special hub accounts. And you can see that this is the, this is the landscape of the accounts. I'm, don't, don't get too hooked up on the, on the details in here because this is an instance where we've been doing some tests. It's on my local machine. So this is just the hub view. The hub view has one of the things that's important, which is a change log. It has accounts, certificate authority is not implemented yet. So that's gonna come next. And let me show you what participants look like. This is the page where you will see the list of enrolled participants um, that are part of the scheme. So we usually have the green bank and the blue bank. Those are connected to these nice TTK instances. One is blue, one is green, obviously, um, so that we can, um, simulate everything that we do. Um, and by the way, uh, kudos to VJ and the team, the core team for building the TTK. It's really awesome tool. So I'm gonna show you some of the enhancements in participants. For those of you who've, who've been paying attention to this, there's a lot more tabs here. Um, I'm just gonna go through them and um, I'll do some exercises after. The first one is that there's a dedicated change log uh, tab. Everything that happens to a participant has a dedicated change log. 
as well as an audit entry. But you can see in here exactly what happened for the participant to be at the state where it is now. The second part is there's an endpoint registration that I've showed in the past. There's accounts. These accounts come from another bounded context, as I showed you. There's another thing that we created um, in this past PI, which is when you create an account, you now have a workflow so that you don't get to create an account just because you want to create an account. So you need a Michael Checker verification. You, you do a request. And this workflow, let me just, um, actually, I don't have the ability to create. I'm going to create an account in Tanzania, a position account. And what's going to happen is that an account change request was created. There's no account yet. What there is, is a change request in here. So again, we keep the log, we keep the log of every change in state. If I try to approve this, you're going to get the usual, the usual error, which is make a checker. The person who created cannot be approving. So let me log out. Again, very safe password. And if I now go to my green bank participant and I look at my accounts, I have this change request. And this change request is to create an account. So it's only when I approve, oh, sorry, a bug. No, no worries. So the if this was all working perfectly, what would have happened was that you would have a, an account in here. So. This bit of demo is just to show that you cannot create accounts, you cannot change accounts without an approval flow or an approval step. So let me try again. I think this is not, yeah. So I think this is because of the currency. All right, so the next thing that I want to show you is changing the bank details. Um, one of the things that was requested when we were doing settlements is that when settlements is, is being performed, we need a way of connecting the settlement account that is registered in the switch to the account name in the settlement bank. And, and that's going to be an, identify, an identifier of, of the settlement account or the settlement um, account in the settlement bank. So what we have now is for settlement accounts, you can change the bank details. So I can do this. I can have uh, my ID, which is probably going to be an IBAN or something like this. And I can give it a name. And again, what happens, and maybe I, I will be able to show the, the changes, what's happening is that a request was created. It's a request to change account bank details. And as usual, I cannot approve it. So let me log out, log in as a, another user. And by the way, the users, the fact that the user is called admin, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. What matters is that the user has privileges to perform these actions. I'm going to go to my accounts and I have this request to change my bank details. So I'm going to change them. And now you see that the details have changed. So what happened was to, to change the details, I have to go through an approval uh, step. And finally, at the end, the details have been changed. The next thing that we created was a, a context page. And, and this is, again, um, an important perspective or an important information for the, for the operators to have the context view for the DFS fee, for the participant in here. I'm not going to demo all of this because it's exactly the same thing. To create a contract, a contact in here, you need to create a request, and then you need someone to approve that request with the right privileges. The other thing that was created recently was the ability to disable a participant. So now we have, we can create a disable participant request or a change participant status request so that participants can be enabled and disabled. What it means in terms of the switch is if a participant is disabled, nothing can happen to that participant. So no activities can be executed. We have in the backlog a functionality to create the pause um, participant uh, uh, feature. And, and that means that the participant is going to be enabled for certain things, but you're not going to be able to transact with that participant. So let me just go to the next one. The other things that I don't think was were, were demoed before is the funds movement and the NDC, the net debit cap 
it goes through exactly the same workflow. You have the ability of creating a net debit cap request. Once it's approved, it becomes effective. Funds movements. This is exactly the same thing as before as well. I'm going to, to demonstrate a deposit. I'm going to deposit, uh, I don't know, 100 euros in this account. As usual, what happens is that a request gets created. And I can do this because I have a role that has privileges to do this. And I will explain this in more detail when we get to the security part. Um, I'm going to keep doing this just so, you, so, just so you, you can see it. There's a maker check violation because obviously I cannot approve my own request. So again, I have to log out. I should make this easier. Okay, I am back. I'm going to the green bank and the funds movement, it's still here waiting to be approved. I'm going to approve it. There we are. I have an extra 100 euros. So the, the same flow exists for everything that changes a participant or has a consequence in the change of the participant's accounts. For an operator to execute these actions, the operator needs the right privileges and someone else needs to approve their actions with the right privileges to approve. Those are two distinct privileges. So that's it from the, from the participant side. The, those were the news. Let me now go to the account lookup. And, oh, looks like I don't have the privilege to view all oracles in this, uh, with this user. So that's why I'm not gonna be able to view all of this. This is one of the things where the admin UI needs to be a bit better. Uh, the user experience is going to be increased. Obviously, we, we, we are doing that every time that we can. It's not the most important focus right now is make, making it pretty, but we're trying to make it very usable. What happens just now is that my user has no privilege to view the oracles, and this is proving the point. So let me log out and log in with the user that actually has. With one hand is harder. And I'm going to see that was not what I wanted to show you. Oracles. So this user has the right privileges. That's why it actually can see this list. I'm going to register an Oracle. The functionality of Oracles is the same as you all know. We can register multiple Oracles. Um, to register an Oracle, you have to give it a name. I'm going to call it like this. You will select the party um, uh, or the party type for this type of, of um, Oracle. I'm going to say it's the Misden, or yeah, I don't know how to say this better. And in here, you have the possibility of doing one of two things. Either you register a remote Oracle, which conforms to the Oracle API specification, and you simply point this registration to the right endpoint, and you have a remote Oracle, or you can use the built-in Oracle. So this is a facility that comes built-in with Modulo vNext. You always have a built-in Oracle if you choose to use it. I'm going to create a built-in one for this type of, it's not properly spelled, but it's good enough. So here I have, I have my new Oracle that's going to respond Misden requests. Let me use the health check. The health check is working. Obviously this is locally working on my machine, so it must work. What can we do now with an Oracle? Um, we have a nice page that we use for tests. Um, we developers are very lazy. So one of the first things that we did was create a page to do tests so that we didn't have to use Postman so much. Um, this is currently the test that we have. And one of such pages is this for the account lookup. And this is where we can test the lookups. So let me do an association. I'm going to associate uh, to the with the blue bank, my phone number. Let's say that my phone number is four twos. So if I associate this, what's going to happen is that this page is actually sending a request to the FSPI OP API. So again, this is an important detail to explain. We're not doing anything directly to a database or directly to a service. We're using the external API, the usual one from Modulope. So this is FSP IOP version 1.1, by the way. So what happened was that we received the request. And if I come here to my associations, I now have my account, my party associated with the blue bank in the built-in Oracle. 
So this is this page shows all of the associations that the built-in Oracle includes. Um, I had this done previously, this IBAN association, and I now have this one. So what can I do with this? Obviously I can do lookups. So let me try a lookup and remember, let me just clear this. What we are working with is a TTK. So effectively the green bank is a TTK and the blue bank is a TTK. They are both registered with this. So I'm going to do another test in the account lookup, which is I'm going to pretend that I am the green bank and I'm asking, I'm asking which participant has the account identified by a MISDEN with the ID 222. So I sent this request, I'm the green bank. Let's see if the green bank got a response. Here we are. So the green bank got a response. What happened was exactly the same thing. And I'm repeating because this is an important point. That page, this page went to the FSPI OP API and sent the request just like Green Bank would do. And this, the, the engine responded, processed that message, responded with the usual response, which is it goes inside, it looks at the associations, it finds that party identifier, and it returns to the Green Bank, which is the requester. Here's the, the participant that owns it. So I, I can I can do a get party as well. Let's do a get party. Let me just see who who owns what. So the blue bank owns, <clears throat> sorry, the green bank owns this um, IBAN account. So let us do a get party, pretending that I'm the blue bank, and I'm going to search by IBAN. So if I do this, what's supposed to happen is that if I'm the blue bank, I'm going to ask the question. And I should be getting an answer. Let's give it a second. Well, here we are. So what happened was, let me show you exactly. What happened was the same request went to the switch. The first question that was answered was, who owns this account? That answer is, it's the green bank. The second thing that happened was, okay, let's go to the green bank and give me the information on that account. And then the response was sent to the party who asked for it. So again, the same thing happens. This is going through the external API, nothing, nothing. Um, it's the beauty of this is that it works exactly. Uh, it, it's just, just module loop, Not, nothing special in here. The, the special part is the internals. So that's it on the account um, lookup. Another thing that's worth mentioning that we don't have the ability to, to demo here with this nice page is that it does bulk already. So. The, the engine is already supporting uh, bulk lookups and it's pretty fast at doing so. So when, uh, in the future, we will show uh, benchmarks for this. I now like to go to quotes and um, this is the quote pages. This is the quotes page, I'm sorry. This is where you can see all of the quotes. Um, you can see a detail on a quote. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to create a quote. Again, I'm gonna use the, this nice example. This is similar to what you've seen before. Um, I'm going to create a quote with example values. Essentially, it's just green bank sending to the blue bank 10 euros. So let's create this quote. It's pending. Let's give it a second. It's accepted now. So let's, let's see what happens in the TTK. We got the request for the quote and it went to those two, exactly the same thing. And I'm, I'm repeating, I know, but this is an important point. This test goes to the FSPI OP API. It does not go directly to the system. It's pretending to be an external call. It's just like when you're using Postman. So this quote was, was accepted. Let's now see some of the details of the quote. quote. You, you can see that the list of parties involved. You can see all of this. You can also see the, the fees. These fees come from the TTK. The TTK is, is, is set up to respond with these default values. So this comes from the quote response. And you can also see the ILP packet. So this is the decoding of the ILP, the Interledger protocol packet. You can see everything that's inside, which is really good for debugging information. Um, as I mentioned, well, I didn't mention actually, but we, we also have bulk quotes. We don't have any bulk quote in here, but the system is also prepared to do bulk quotes with the usual API. So it's again, supporting bulk quotes. Let me now go to transfers and I'll show you the transfer screen. This is, this is the transfer screen. It's looking a bit nicer. Some of the things that we've been spending time is, is, is getting 
the UX to be a bit more usable or the UI to be a bit more usable. And, and some of those things, we've been getting a lot of suggestions from the people that are seeing this and participating in the workshops is having filters, having pagination, all of those things have been included. And, um, and we're now having a, a, a bit, we have a lot of data now in the tests that we do. So it becomes unmanageable to not have per, uh, pag pagination. So this is what a, transfers look, a transfer looks like. Let me do a transfer to test it. So I'm going to use the same principle. Uh, a transfer must be preceded by a quote. So I'm going to create a quote. There's my quote, it's pending. It's been accepted. Um, I have another button, which is a test button, which is from a quote, because I'm in a development environment, I'm able to create a test transfer from that quote. I'm going to do exactly that. It's reserved and now it's committed. So I have a transfer. Let me let us look at the transfer. It has exactly the same, it, it's the same principle. So the screen we, we will show similar information. You have the parties, you have the ILP packet decoded for, for, um, for ease of search. And one of the things that Jason also showed is the transfer has already been allocated to a batch to a, in, in settlements. And, and, and this happened automatically. So I can search for this transfer in my in my um, uh, transfer, in, uh, sorry, in in my um, settlements, and I find I can find the batch where this transfer was allocated to, and I'm now going to create a dynamic matrix with this batch. I'm going to lock it for settlement. I'm going to settle this matrix, which means that this these ten euros those are settled now. So if I go to to back to my to my participant, I'm going to see that the balance is zero, but I have 90 more. Actually, uh, sorry, I, I didn't show this the right way. Let me, let me do it again. Let me create a quote really quickly. There's my quote. I'm gonna create a test transfer so that you can see the intermediate step on the accounts. So I have my transfer. And what you can see in here is that the green bank has a position of minus 10 because it owes money. And look at this number, this, I don't know, it's a gigantic number, it's this 1 million and 90. This is the liquidity account for, for the green bank. Let's look at the blue bank. The blue bank has 10 in balance. This is the position of the blue bank. He hasn't deposited, he didn't deposit any money in here. So the only thing that he has is a positive position because he received that transfer. Let us, let us now settle that transfer. I'm assuming it's this one. So I'm gonna create a static matrix for this. I'm going to lock it, settle it. It is finalized. Let's look at the accounts now. So what you're seeing is that the liquidity account for the green bank is now has now been debited by 10 and the position went back to zero. So this is working as expected. The blue bank has an increased position um, on, on the liquidity. So let me now go to the next part, which is the auditing. And this is what I was mention, mentioning before. Um, I have to explain the fundamental difference between audit, audit entries and logging entries. And logging is for technicians, whatever kind of technicians who wish to understand how the system is working from the technical perspective. Auditing is for auditors or business people that wish to understand how the state of the system is what it is now. And one of the things that we have is we have built-in auditing capabilities. And what's happening every time that you do something that changes the state of the system is that a message is being signed and then double, double envelope logic signed and deposited in an external storage where it's supposed to be read only. What we have in here is a view to that storage of exactly all of the audit entries to make it easy, to make it a, a better user experience. So in here, you can see things like, you can, for example, filter by a certain bounded context. I can see everything that happened to the participants. And I can see that uh, a matrix was settled or a matrix settle event was, was executed. The uh, funds were deposited. This was a fail, as you can see. So what happened is that the system is, is recording the fact that I tried to do a deposit, um, approve a deposit when I didn't have the roles to approve that deposit. So this is all tracked in the auditing uh, system. 
And a lot of the information, a lot more information is behind this entry. I have an IP address, I have the user, I have a lot more valuable information that will be um, um, useful to auditors to understand what happened exactly in this step. So this is the auditing entries. Let me now go to the security. And before going to the security, I need to explain the security model that, that we have in the, in the reference architecture. Um, we have an internal mechanism to provide tokens so that all services and applications, when they talk to each other, they have zero trust. So what happens is if I have two of, of the applications inside the switch asking information to each other, and a, a common thing is, for example, transfers or settlements asking the participants for a participant information, what's happening in all of those calls is that the caller needs a token and that token carries authorization information. So the token will have the roles that the application has. And with the roles, we can discover the privileges that have been associated to the roles. This is a, it's a normal model, but, but, but it works in a, in a distributed manner. And the way it's implemented makes a big difference because of performance. So it's, it's zero trust. It's always secure by default. The, what I'm trying to say is that until you give it roles and privileges, nothing can, no system can do anything. No, no service can call any other service. No user can call anything inside the switch. So with that in mind, let me show you how it works in terms of privileges, starting with the, 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 the base part. All of the applications in module vNext define which privileges they require for a certain application, for a certain action. So for example, if you want to create a user, or let me give you another example from participants. If you want to create a deposit funds movement, you need a privilege for that. So what the application is saying is, I'm the participant's application in version 0.3.5. And what I'm saying is for a user or for a caller, a user or an application coming to my API asking for a deposit um, a funds movement to be created, they need to have this privilege. And this is an important mechanism because we're not verifying security from the outside, we're verifying security from the inside. So all of the applications will publish to a central place the privileges that they require to operate and to be insured during the activity that happens as the system is running. What do we do with those privileges? We create roles. We create roles and the roles will have a list of privileges which are associated to the roles. Let me give you an example. I have this role called tests and this role has only one privilege. It can view quotes. What it means is that this role can log into the system but cannot do anything else except view quotes. It will not be able to view participants. It will not be able to, to do anything else. And if I want to add privileges to this role as a hub operator, I have that ability. So in this page, I have all of the, print, the privileges that are available in my platform, and I can simply choose which ones I want to add. So I can say things like, I want this one to be able to create participant accounts. And what this is going to do is, it's gonna add those privileges. So from now on, if I am a user or an application that has this role, I have this privilege, which means that I can execute these actions in the system. The next question that comes obviously is how do I make sure that I associate the roles and the privileges to users and applications? That's the other part. The design that we have is an has an abstraction in place so that we can connect to multiple identity and access management systems. So. In, in principle, by just building another adapter, we can connect to an active directory, to a, any directory, any, um, um, any system that provides logins. We can just create an adapter, deposit the adapter there and configure it and it should work. For those who don't want to run an external identity access system, we provide a built-in one. So it's exactly the same principle. The objective of the built-in identity and access management system is not to be a, a super secure mechanism, super fast and full of functionality. It provides minimum functionality for, for people to securely manage uh, users and applications. So let, let's give you an example for the uh, quoting. And, and this, is, this is a good example to show what I mean by zero trust principle in the platform. This is a built-in role 
for the quoting service because the quoting service needs to view the global configurations, needs to bootstrap the configurations, view the content, the context, uh, bounded context configurations and view participants. What this screen is telling us is that that application that has a, a client ID and a client secret can only do these things in the platform. They cannot do anything else in other systems. This, a, 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 a system that uses these credentials cannot go to transfers, for example, will be unauthorized. So let me now go to my, sorry, my list. Uh, that's it. I think we're running out of time. So um, I will now ask Hui to show you the, to do a bit of a demo on the TTK and the test that we are running and also the bulk um, work that we did in the past um, few months. So Hui. This is basically the same page that you are used to seeing uh, here, as we can see, I've cleared everything up and we have no quotes and no transfers, either bulk or not. Uh, and uh, Pedro didn't have these, these buttons on his side, but basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the same thing uh, for the bulk quote values. Uh, at the moment, and we will improve this in the future, we have this statically defined to create 50 bulk quotes. Okay, so let's try and create them. Okay, it's spinning at the moment, and now it has been accepted. If we check in the quotes and the bulk quote itself, we can see that the info is here. Uh, now then, let's do the same for the bulk transfers. There's nothing here, so let's use the button dedicated to create these bulk transfers. So this bulk transfer will match the quotes that are inside in terms of transaction ID, for example, which is, is then validated inside the TTK. As you can see, everything is enabled, all the options of val validations. Uh, as another example, uh, as we can see, the position at the moment has something like less 38,000 uh, negative value. So in the end, we are adding 50 transfers of $10 each. So in the end of this process, we should have a negative value of more 500, which will be 38,994. And in the green bank, which is a pay, it's the same thing, but the positive value. So let's do the same thing for the bulk transfer. So it's processing. And as we can see, it has been completed. And now, if we refresh the balances, as you can see, it has increased 500 in value because we have five, uh, 50 transfers of $10 of amount of transfers and the same thing in the pay. Uh, yeah, uh, this is one of the parts of the demo. Uh, and you can see in the, in the, in the TTK, all the quotes that have been sent to. It's a very big list, so we're not going to watch it all, but just for a check here, all these. Thank you, breaking yes. up. Clear this up. And now, uh, one of the aspects that we are trying to improve are the DTK tests because it provides us a, a safety net of what already exists in order for us to make sure that we are respecting the rules of what's uh, already in uh, in VNow. So in the beginning, we were using TTK to validate the, the non-happy paths, which is this DF DFSP folder. And we were only partially uh, validating it. But in the in the past few months, what we've done is, in this example specifically, we have managed to run all the tests, not only the, the, the non-happy paths for the DFSP, but all the tests itself. So while this is running, you will see that uh, all of the 602 tests should uh, successfully pass. Takes a while. Okay, this, this is, yeah, it takes a, a bit. It's a lot of tests. It's a good moment to thank the TTK team again. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah big big shout out for the DK yeah. team. It's a really usable. This facilitates our job yeah. a lot. And, yeah. And uh, a special thanks for VJ, which has been closely uh, making, uh, teaching us how to use this tool more effectively uh, and solving the problems that we've been having in using it along the time. So this should now finish. Okay, we can see that we have so every uh, this one, which are, yeah. And in the hub tests, this is the process where we don't have all the tests here. So what we've done is there are things that we are yet to implement, and there are a lot of tests in this folder for the hub. Uh, and this is where we, we have met with, uh, with Vijay uh, to make sense of what to add in terms of tests, because uh, not everything is, is being implemented at, at the moment, OK? Uh, this, we will add more and more and more tests as we progress in the, with the VNEX in, in, in implementations. And you will see here that uh, a couple of tests will fail due to things that we are yet to implement or uh, small bugs that might exist. But we are, this just to make, just to say that we are aware of these problems and this will also be solved in the near future. So this test that we are talking about should fail uh, between here, if I'm not mistaken. Oops. When they fail, they take a bit longer to execute. So this should be where they fail because of the timeout stuff. Uh, trying the air session. OK, one fail, six fail. And it should be 10, uh, 13 or 14, if I'm not mistaken, that should fail. In total. Okay, let's just wait a bit more. Okay, and now it should be quicker up to the end. Almost. Yeah, maybe it might miss one more, but yeah, it should be there. And that's the reason why we're showing this live is not to bore you to death. It's just to prove that we're actually running these tests, and this is an important thing. It's uh, it helps us yeah. make sure that what we're and doing that's... is working. There we are. Yeah, and I'm showing my hands also. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then we have a third folder which we are calling to the next test. So th this is basically since we are already using this tool, why not also use it? To, to create our own tests. So this is still a small portion of the tests, but it, it already covers the, the basis of our implementations. And in this case, this will all have obviously all pass because uh, it's our own tests of what we already have worked. These ones are a bit faster. Yeah. Well, I spoke too soon. Yeah, the, these these other transfers are a bit tricky sometimes in terms of time of execution. And yeah, as you can see, uh, we have these three suits of tests, and basically what's missing is that we have more and more tests on the hub side, which we it will be added with with time. And yeah, that's it from my side. Uh, Thank you, Rui. Thanks, Peter. And I will give you the word again. OK, so that was the live demo. And please appreciate the value of a live demo. It's, um, it's a brave thing to do, but we want to keep bringing you live demos. It's, it, it, it's an important thing, even though if sometimes it will fail or bore you to death. But this is a, there's a value in doing the, the live demo. Um, Important notes on the demo. All of the calls have been, um, all of these test screens, they are only enabled because we're in development mode. Obviously an operator will not be able to create a quote or a transfer or, um, well, lookups maybe not a big deal, but not a quote or a transfer. And um, all of the requests, they go to the FSP IOP API. 
So there's, there's again, there's no magic here. We don't have the admin U, uh, AP, AP, uh, sorry, the, uh, we don't have the admin UI going directly to the services inside the switch. They go to the external API just like anything else. So we're just facilitating the user experience. And um, obviously regarding ISO 22002, as Michael Richards says, uh, we would like to have an API for this as soon as possible. So we invite you all to participate when we can. This is code coverage results. Um, I have to say I'm showing the best ones, So, but that's life. <laughs> uh, th these three, FSPIOP bounded context, account lookup and transfers, they have more than 90% code coverage of lines, functions, statements. Um, obviously, th there's a couple more that have pretty well. Um, there's a, a few that are in the 70s, and there are some that we need to keep on working on. But but this is something that we need to, to show. This is, um, this is all of these code coverage results are automatically published in Circle CI as part of our CI CD pipeline. So we keep, every time that we push new code, they get tested and these results get published. So it's pretty easy to access them. Um, these are the results from the testing toolkit before. So as you, as you can see, we had not even 500 tests and five were failing. This is from the last PI. In this BI, we now have close to uh, 1,300 tests. This is taking a bit. The new slide is showing a better picture, obviously. I'm going to wait a bit. Apparently, there's a lag in Zoom. But um, as I was saying, and let's wait for this to come, the recent test that, that Hui has showed, what we are, what the, the level that we are now is we have 1,300 tests passing and um, 13 failing. So it's a, it's a very minute um, percentage. If I'm not mistaken, the TTK provides us around 3,000 um, tests. So we need to keep on working so that we have coverage for the rest of it. So what about next steps? Um, the beta release is planned for the end of November. That was the, the, the plan. We are on track to deliver on that plan. There's already the version, the, the sorry, the alpha version that has been published and we have two ways or two flavors for, for anyone who wishes to try it. We have the mini loop vnext, which is for everyone. It's the, the typical vnext flavor. It's a, um, a very simple install fashion that will run in a local, in a VM in your computer using not a lot of resources. So it's probably the best way to start. And if you're a developer, we have, dev we have Docker Compose uh, scripts so that you can run it local in your development machine. This is the roadmap to production. It's work in progress because there's a lot of unknowns in, in, in front of us. So um, we released the alpha um, at the end of Q2, last PI. Um, we are on target to the releasing a beta version at the end of November. And the um, as, as Paul Macon um, showed us last, um, last Tuesday, the, the new name, Baobab, I hope I'm saying it correctly, the, the code name for this version or for this release in a release candidate quality level um, is planned for Q2 2024. How do we work? Um, we do fortnightly workshops. We, we work in sprints, two week sprints aligned with, with everything that Modulop is doing. We do fortnightly workshops. These, these workshops have three parts. The first part is we talk about the update of the last sprint. So what, what was accomplished in the, during the last sprint. We then have a demo usually um, to show what we built the last week, something that is visible. And then the second part of it is just hearing from the community and asking questions to the community and having discussion, showing the code, asking questions about what they need to see, what they want to see, et cetera. We do a sprint planning and uh, backlog groom, grooming session on, on um, Wednesdays. I forgot to put it in here every week. And then we have three working sessions, uh, three work sessions and stand up every week, one on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. All of the code is obviously on GitHub. The backlog is in Zen Hub, which is in GitHub as well. All of the pipelines and test results are on Circle CI CD as part of the default strategy. And uh, for developers, we have snapshot releases for Docker images and Kubernetes available in, in, um, in GitHub. For non-developers, again, please use Miniloop. It's the easiest way. The last slide is um, really where I ask for an applause for this amazing team. We've been having the support of DitzaWorks and Interledger Foundation, previously COIL. And um, obviously, none of this would be possible without the team. Thank you, and a round of applause to the team.
Um, first of all, uh, amazing job. Huge congratulations to you and the entire team in getting this far. It's It's been a journey, but it, you've done extremely well. And uh, I think the whole community would congratulate you on it. Um, I think you de demonstrated that you're improving all the time on the functional equivalence of VNext versus the the existing um, uh, um, the existing core that we have now, and you're demonstrating that at not least through the use of TTK. Um, uh, you're using the same tool that we are using for testing the core as stands. So, I mean, that's pure. That's good practice. I mean, there's a lot of work to be done clearly on uh, completing the 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 um, the functional um, capabilities and on um, extending the testing, et cetera, and doing all the golden path testing, et cetera. But this is a, a solid step forward. Um, you showed a lot of the portals, and that's great. Um, I mean, it's important to say, I think, that um, almost all those functions that you were showing are actually in the existing uh, motor loop. But it's good to see that you've learned from um, what we've done in Mojo Loop, what's I calling it this week, vote Mojo Loop 15, and have improved it to to the point where the user experience is so much better, or in many cases, and adding extra portals where there were gaps previously. I think overall, what I'd say is, um, I think we're very pleased to have got to this point and to be able to place Baobab on the roadmap, so that we can plan towards its the creation of a release candidate and its adoption for uh, essentially the end of Q2 next year. So yeah, well done to you and the team. Thank you, Paul. And yes, it's, a, it's an important me message that I want to stress. This is not ready. If you want to experiment, please do. We need feedback. Do not use it for anything serious. That's an important message. Don't, don't, uh, we, we, we need more time to get this to a good place. Steve, so also to echo what Paul said, I mean, it's it's amazing to see you guys get this close to the existing feature set, and from a non-technical person to be able to see things in a in a slicker way. So having watched the features developed on up to V15 without this UI, this is now so much clearer to me. So congratulations to you guys on on getting to this point, and for again for a non-techie, this this development has been easier for me to follow. So. First, congratulations to you guys on that. Um, this on the UI though, I mean, it is so slick. It is very nice. In the current the current way to, at V15, we have a UI available, but hub, hub operators can choose to use that UI or not. The most important thing from our side is that the APIs are in the background that they can plug in to their existing UI or they can modify the existing UI that we have in V15. Just to confirm, it's the same thing for what you guys are doing. They don't have to use this UI. They can modify it. They can plug it in, plug in the APIs to their existing UI. Is that correct? Absolutely not. Okay. Just make sure. This is API first. We Everything that you saw was something connecting to the API. So all of those buttons, we provide this. The, the philosophy is it should include everything. And it has a built-in ledger, but we have the option of using Tiger Beetle, which is working. Uh, so if you need proper ledger performance and scalability, you use Tiger Beetle. If you don't need to, you use the built-in ledger. It's good enough. If you need um, integrating it with external tools for auditing, for logging, for uh, uh, performance measuring, or for, uh, for example, the, the depositing of other databases, you can do it. So the point is, we have made sure that we don't fall into the same trap of becoming hostages of license changes. That's another point that's important as well. And this comes from the reference architecture. We set ourselves a goal to make sure that everything that we do is open and that we can pivot. If we need to change, we can change without breaking the whole. And this is an important process. It's it, it, Unfortunately, it sounds easy, but uh, it, it's actually quite complex to, to do these things. So, And the, the, the congratulations as well, obviously, for the team that designed the reference architecture where I participated because it did a very good job. So it's really easy for us to now implement the reference architecture. So. The answer is absolutely yes. You don't need to use this UI. Awesome. Um, there are two hands. James, uh, I'll let you go first and then Michael. Thank you. I'll just check you can all hear me okay? Yep. Hey, James. Great. Uh, yeah, my apologies for not being in the room. 
Um, I really wanted to be there to see this, but I have watched the, the whole show on Zoom. Very impressive, Pedro. I, I want to acknowledge once again the amount of effort that's gone in here um, from that uh, that large team of people. Um, your, your work is hugely appreciated. The evolution um, is massively exciting. I'm, I'm really looking forward to the Baobab release um, uh, as soon as possible. So thank you very much. I'll, I'll, I'll double double down on your request for more participation from people around the community. Please get in, involved with this work stream. Um, Mojo Loop needs to be a continually evolving thing. Um, we don't want to stand still. This is part of that process. Uh, it's massively important. Th thank you so much, guys. Thank you, James. Uh, just one other thing, Pedro. Did I understand what you said correctly, that there will no longer be an admin API in, in vNext? Is that correct? No, there's an admin API. It exists. It's an the same. external admin API. There's an admin API. The difference is that because of the way we rearranged some of the structures internally, the data structures, I'll give you an example. In the current um, uh, version, we have participants and participant accounts close together. And we have some structures that are closely to tied together in a database and in a data structure. With the reference architecture, we decided to split participants to one side, uh, accounts to the other side, settlements to another side. What the consequence of this is that when you ask for a participant information, you will see a different structure. The same data, essentially, but it's arranged in a different structure. So. Yes, we do have admin APIs, all of those that, that you've seen working, they are slightly different in some aspects. And no, we can... I mean, and that's perfectly fine, I think. Uh, yes. I'd be the first to say that the existing admin APIs need a bit of love. Um, but so, so there is as it, there, an open API definition. There is. That's we're we're working on, publi on publishing a Swagger definition for it. Yep. And if necessary, we can have a conversion layer for a period of adaptation. It's not ideal to have conversion layers. It decreases. No, no, absolutely not. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm perfectly OK with the idea that um, we're going to talk about how those things are going to change. Um, I just want to make sure that yes. I think, you know, reinforcing what Steve said, there will be yes. an open API definition for it. Yes, we don't have one yet, but we will. It's promised. Awesome. Next, um, James, you have the last comment. A short one. Yeah. I'm I just wanted to clarify, I think um, my understanding, Pedro, is that each bounded context ex exposes its own mini admin API. Am I right? Yes, correct. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. Um, all right. Miller, you have the last comment here. Yeah. Real briefly, I think that there are a number of uh, I'll call them learning facilities that turn into useful facilities later in a couple of those things. One is you talk about the uh, RBAC, that is the role-based access control throughout here, but you're actually talking about policy. You're yep. saying, see, I can't do this because I'm logged in as that. That's policy and it's configuration. But below that is code, hard code in the system that's looking for specific permissions. Yes. It would be very helpful if we had uh, probably a tool that would pull out of the code those things which are the hard-coded permissions that are going to be tested and to pull out of the policy configuration how you've defined roles and how you've mapped those roles onto those permissions in some way that we can actually you know reason about it in a deployment environment so that people can say i've got five people doing this thing but i only have three doing that and they can do their own internal mapping of real users to real roles I think that tool would be really helpful to see. Anyway, it just it's a it's a very good point. It's a roadmap. I get it, but it, uh, thank you. It, it, anyway, this is all, this is amazing work. I, I love you, seeing it taken taking this form. Thank you. Thank you. We we have a bit of that that you're asking. We have a page where you can see all of the privileges. And again, this comes from an API, so we can package it in a different way. We can download this. Um, these are the these are all of the privileges that all of the applications require to operate, which they it's code. So if you see here, these are all of the privileges that we are asking a security context, do you have this privilege before you continue executing this action? Then what we have is the role management capability where you can associate your privileges to roles. So this is how you make sure that some roles have some privileges, but not others. And again, this is an API. So 
we can package this in a way that facilitates the onboarding. So you have a file that, for example, will describe what are the privileges for certain roles for a certain organization. You can put them away. You can even upload them to a, a non-productive environment, which facilitates a lot of things going forward. And then you have the last bit, which is where you associate users and applications to the roles, thus associating users to roles and then to privileges. So all of this is API based. All of this can be made a lot better. So yes, thanks Miller. Awesome. Um, thank you so much, Pedro and team. Thanks, for them. Thanks everyone.